Tonight is our second part to Herschel Island, the nature of plants, birds, and animals of this Arctic island. Also, visitors that go to Herschel go there especially to see its natural state. Herschel Island is a haven for flocks of birds, ducks, and a variety of wild animals. Also tonight, the establishment of an Anglican mission and an RCMP detachment helped in controlling alcohol to the Inuit. I'd like to congratulate Politak on the opening of their new community airport. Welcome to Swangan, I'm Stan Rubin. Herschel Island cold and desolate in the winter, in the spring, summer, and fall, warm and renewing with plants and animal life. Herschel Island was named in 1826 when Sir John Franklin explored the area. Chief Park Ranger Andy Tardiv explains exactly who it was named after. Well, there's a debate on that too because it, it, it could be named after an astronomer that, that um, went on one of uh, Sir John Franklin's earlier expeditions, or it could be named after his father, who was also an astronomer. Like so, um, so the, there's a, there's a, like there's questions about just who it was named after. Like, but it's presumed that since the um, younger um, um, William, I think his name was William Henry Herschel or something. They both had similar names, but one was senior and junior, and I, I think it was, I think it was the junior member that that was on these expeditions that it was named after. Yeah. How about Pauline Cove? Pauline Cove was named after um, um, after one of the wives that was on one of the uh, whaling whaling ships. But you must remember that most of the names that are along this coast here, um, that I know of anyway, uh, beginning with the, uh, in the Mackenzie Delta there, was named by Sir John Franklin, like Captain Franklin in those days. And the sighting of, um, of Herschel was, um, was made in uh, 1826, on this exact day of July the 17th, according to some documents. But most of the names, like I said, were were um, were um, um, were put in by um, Franklin's expedition of 1826 when he went the western tour and sent the other party with, I think it was a, a fellow by the name of Richardson, who took the eastern side. One hundred years ago, Herschel Island was probably the most populated in all of the Yukon Territory. With so many men isolated from the outside world. It was hard to keep law and order among the whaling crews and Inuit. Alcohol was a major problem among the whalers and Inuit living at Herschel Island. Although the captains of the Pacific Steam Whaling Company ships banned the sale of whiskey, a few bottles always ended up in the hands of the Inuit. Whiskey was a cause of a few tragic deaths. Some men were shot and others stabbed to death in drunken brawls. It was like the Wild West, only this time in a frozen expanse of land and sea. Reports of wild drinking parties reached an energetic young Anglican missionary at Fort McPherson, the Reverend Isaac O. Stringer. In 1893, he journeyed by dog sled to Herschel Island. The captains welcomed his presence and appreciated his pastoral visits because he was influential in solving tensions that built among isolated men. Over the years, Isaac O. Stringer would make several more trips to Herschel Island. In 1895, he began preparations to establish a permanent mission. The next year, he was successful.
the captain signed an agreement allowing no whiskey to be sold or traded to Canadian natives. The Inuvialuit and whalers were still making liquor by using gun barrel stills. These they kept hidden away. In 1897, the Anglican mission was established at Herschel Island. The Reverend Isaac O. Stringer and his wife Sadie would begin residence. They would enjoy good and friendly relations with the whalers and Inuit over the many years. Isaac O. Stringer would become known as the bishop who ate his boots. The Canadian government heard complaints over many years but never took an active role in the affairs of Herschel Island. The Royal Northwest Mounted Police, as they were called, began policing in 1903. The Hudson's Bay Company reported that untaxed trade goods were coming into Canada with the whaling fleet. The HBC's monopoly on trade of furs was being invaded. When they first came to the um to the island in 1903, then there were more uh, more custom agents, and they and they they came here on the request of the um, of the missionaries actually in the Hudson Bay Company, and uh, because of um, the introduction of alcohol and um, all these other unfortunate things that were happening at that time, like so. Um, well, with with a lot of like this was actually the the before um, 1898. This was the largest community at one time in the whole of the Yukon. So, with that along and with no laws to abide by or or anything like that, then then it I guess it was pretty wild here. The Royal Northwest Mounted Police sent two officers, Sergeant Fitzgerald and Corporal Monroe. Like Isaac Stringer, they were welcomed by the captains and were told that they were about six years too late. Their presence on this island would reinforce the captain's control over already unruly crews. Well, to begin with, um, they were well, fairly well received by the whalers, actually, and a lot of it had to do with the way that they presented themselves. Like, uh, they had a lot of bravado, even though they didn't have any... Uh, uh, sort of an, an uh, agenda to go by, like from the fe from the federal government, but still they did they did uh, a lot of things just by by bluff. And so when they encountered um, you know the whalers, like you know I'm the cap the captains of the whale ships actually actually um, actually really uh, like that sort of thing. Like you know they like the missionaries being there. They like the uh, the Royal Northwest Mounted Police being there because you can have law and order then, eh? But the Inuit, um, at that stage, um, were, uh, from from the accounts that we know anyway, I mean, some of them were easily influenced into it because of the, because of their Alaskan background and then they knew about law and order in those areas. But the ones from, from this area here, um, it took them a while to to accept them as the you know as as, as somebody with law and order like the RCMP or Royal Canadian Mounted Police would stay at Herschel Island providing law and order for many years they gained the respect of whalers traders and Inuvialuit all along the coast in 1964 the Royal Canadian Mounted Police left the Herschel Island detachment for good this plaque commemorates all police officers and special constables that served at Herschel Island from 1903 to 1964, a long and proud tradition of service in the frozen north. The waters of Herschel Island supports an abundance of ducks, birds, seals, fish, and caribou. In May and June, ducks of all species common to the northern coast flock to Herschel Island. Here they will lay their eggs feed their young until it is time to fly back south to wintering locations. Herschel Island's habitat makes it a haven for animals and plant life during the short Arctic summer. 
This island seems to have been formed specially for plants and animals. According to uh, geologists, they did a they did a, a test on the on the, on the island, and it's mostly um, mostly glacier and permafrost with uh, covered with moraine, like off the ocean floor. So what? Um, um, the uh, expanding glaciers went um, to the um, northwest side of the island, like the extent of the of the last glacier, or or even the glacier before, was. Um, so it went on the on the northwest side of the island, and then curved down, and went um, uh, to the east side of the Firth River. And so. What the glacier did while it was um, while it was expanding was that it it dug into the ocean floor, and then left all the uh, moraine um, on uh, where Herschel Island sits now. And as it retreated, then it left the glacier and the moraine on, and and formed as an island. Waterfowl and land animals inhabit Herschel Island at different times of the year. From May till September is the most important. Big mammals that that occupy the area, you'd like to like, that that people see uh, uh, here in the springtime is, is you get your polar bears. Polar bears actually den on the island, and um, and moving with with the polar bears. Of course, you get the you get the sea mammals, which is the seals, mostly the ring seals. Uh, you get your ugiuk, uh, the bearded seal. Um, and then you get a, nowadays you don't see the occurrences of walruses coming in, but, but we had, we were fortunate to, to, um, to have one visit the island there in, um, while people were still on the island in 1990. And uh, moving inland from there, of course, you get your fishes. Um, you get your different types of fishes, which is uh, Arctic char, um, uh, different types of um, uh, of herring, and of course you get your flounders and uh, um and uh, and shayfish, coney, and then we have a. Um, we're fortunate to have a resident herd of about 40 caribou that stay year-round here on the island. Uh, the number's going up and down, maybe 30 or 40 a year. And um, then you get your grizzly bears. Sometimes they visit the island in numbers. Other times there's only one. And, and this year we don't have any spotted as yet, but it's still fairly early in the season. And then you have the Arctic foxes, uh, which uh, den in cycles. Like, and uh, in 1988, there was eight eight dens here on the island that were recorded. And you get your cross foxes, red foxes. Um, you get wolves, uh, wolverine. Uh, and last year we had a uh, a cow moose and two calves. That, that stayed for that spring and, and, uh, and the whole of the summer. And the year before that, we had two uh, muskox that stayed the, the whole of the summer, which was really, uh, really beneficial to the tourists that came over here, because they wouldn't even shake our hands. They'd just go rushing towards the muskox and take all a bunch of pictures. Like... This island is a bird watcher's paradise, from the smallest to the largest of winged animals. There are plenty of plants and insects that the ducks and birds rely on to support themselves and their young. Yeah, there's about uh, 69 species of birds and ducks that come and visit the island from, you get them as big as the tundra swans and as small as the uh, hoary red poles. So there's songbirds and shorebirds and ducks, diving ducks and, and geese. Uh, the major ones that we, uh, that we uh, 
account for or do um, numbers on is the ones within the vicinity of the, um, of the community here. And we do transects, um, we do guillemot counts, we do, well, with, with the counts themselves, we do the egg counts, the chick counts, and, uh, and, and with, the, um, with the rough-legged hawks that are around, then we do um, nest counts and egg counts also. But uh, at one time they had a tagging, um, they had uh, bird tagging going on, like with the guillemots and the rough-legged hawks. But this year, um, with the um, rise in the lemming and vole populations, we have uh, a larger number of snowy owls than, than, than were before. Like in, in the peak years, then you'd have um, rough-legged hawk nests numbering as, as many as uh, 28 to 30 or something like that, which is fairly large. And Nesting sites are very important once the ducks, geese, and birds reach Herschel Island. The first birds to nest have a better chance for their eggs to hatch and their chicks to grow. And if eggs are taken by predators, the birds still have a chance to reproduce. Uh, the first ones to nest on the island would be the um, snow buntings. And at times you'd have, maybe in one nest, you'd have two broods in a, in a season. So they would be the earliest. And, um, but like, um, like among the other, um, other large, um, other large birds uh, would be uh, the cranes. Cranes nest fairly early too, as soon as the snow melts. So, so you get your, your four types of loons here. Um, you get your Arctic loon, yellow-billed loon, um, the common loon, and the red-throated loon. But the one that, that is, um, that annually um, is a resident here and, and actually nests on this island is the red-throated loon. Whenever waterfowl or bird nests are found, the rangers record the number of eggs, the location, the time of hatching, and how many chicks actually live or die. Egg counts were also done on the more abundant of birds, the black guillemots. Their habitat, the cliffs, are slowly eroding away. They moved from the, um, from the mud cliffs into, onto the shoreline, and they were using the driftwood like as nests, and then they found that um, they found the mission house, and that's where they'd, they'd nest. They, they were nesting in the eaves. Um, and later on, the biologist um, uh, built um, built nesting areas uh, both on top and inside inside the um, the old mission house. Herschel Island is full of wild vegetation: lichens that feed the caribou and the muskox, plants and flowers that feed the birds and insects. Um, as far as plants, as far as plants are concerned. Uh, I just don't know how many numbers. They must number way over the hundreds. Like, but as far as flowers and that are concerned, um, there, I, I don't, it's, it's been documented before, but I don't really know what their numbers really are. But I know that, that the plants are, are seasonal plants and, and, and within, like, um, from the latter part of May, then you get your south-facing slopes that have, and as soon as the snow melts, then you get your little hardy plants, the ones with the woolly um, covering on the, on, on, the, um, on the sprouts that come out, like the woolly louseworts and uh, glacial avens. Um, then um, it, they really have a, a, have a short um, lifespan. It might be two to three weeks, and then you get your other plants coming in, and it seems like that they run in, into um, into three different cycles that I I could that, that I've I've noted anyway, and uh, and these plants as soon as one dies off, then another um, then another uh, flower w would be the one that's more dominant, and then in the fall time, then you get your hardier plants also, like the ones that can stand the cold and uh, of the fall weather. Tourists that go to Herschel Island see flowers and plants that bloom only at certain times of year. Also, some animals that might be in sight at the time. They have a, a variety of interests. 
like you know um, some of them come here to see uh, maybe something that's cultural um, others come to see the historical buildings and a lot of them come to see the birds and the and the uh, and the flowers and it's really a, a haven of um, because the the flowers are so um, numerous and so um, uh, like you can see um, 10 different kind of flowers on maybe a small little hummock that maybe a, is a foot square. Some plants reportedly have medicinal purposes. Probably the old Inuit from ancient times used these for minor aches and pain. Others are said to have poisons. Um, some of the plants are just just good eating, like the Arctic dock, the mountain sorrel, and the um, and the uh, um, the rhubarb. Once visitors go to Herschel Island, park rangers will interpret the history of the whalers, the Inuvialuit, and also species of plants, flowers, and birds. Plane loads of tourists keep the rangers busy two or three times a day. I enjoy working here. Like, it's, it's a place that's, um, that, that's um, fairly stress-free especially when there's no one, nobody else around except two other rangers or something like that, you know? And it's, it's um, to me, it, 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 it holds a special value to me because my, 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 my mother was born just across the border in a little place called Gordon, and she grew up all along this coast. And, and uh, my sister was born just on, uh, on the mainland side at uh, Tarmigan Bay. And uh, my younger sister, um, Lillian, actually was raised on, on this coast here. So, and my, my grandparents uh, lived on this coast for, for years and years, like er ever since the whaling days, actually. Park rangers also keep in touch with Inuvialuit that use Herschel Island or Kikaktagruk and the mainland for hunting and summer camping grounds. The importance of Herschel Island and the North Slope to the Inuvialuit is the abundance of caribou and fish. Herschel Island Territorial Park has changed to accommodate people's curiosity about its history. It's a great tourist attraction for naturalists and anyone wishing to explore its ancient background. For thousands of years, this unspoiled land provided food for countless generations of traveling Inuit. In the never-ending struggle for food and clothing, Inuit of old would travel hundreds of miles to reach Herschel Island and the North Slope. Places like this would be used until it was time to travel again, this time to wintering spots along this vast coast of the Yukon's North Slope. There's three tin warehouses here, and one of them was, uh, the back end of it was used for um, for a temporary uh, shelter, like during the summer months. So um, it was made out of um, out of parts of the ship that they could find the lumber and uh, the mainsails. So they had a cozy little place for the summer months. Oh yeah. Uh, there's three bin buildings on this corner here, and um, all three of them were used by uh, Peterson, uh, and um, and he. Um, he was one of the American traders that came in in the early early days of the fur trade after the whaling industry had petered out. And uh, the far building there, the Northern Whaling and Trading um, Company warehouse, was um, was used both as a um, as sort of like a store and um, and living quarters for the for the uh, workers during the summer months. And. Uh, in that building there, we have um, um, we have graffiti from uh, uh, from the 1948 um, uh, 1948 when the when the Saint Brock did its um, did its western tour um, across the Northwest Passage. Are these two part of the first buildings that were built? 
Um, no, they aren't. They're they're fairly late, as uh, as far as the buildings that are standing now. Uh, they were probably built, um, say, before 1920, or say around 1920 and later, and were used uh, only, say, uh, seasonally. Mm -hmm. So, um, because they were in competition with the Hudson Bay, then their prices from the states was a lot less than the ones here um, that the uh, bay was was charging, and and so they had customers as um, uh, far uh, up the Mackenzie as Arctic Red River and Fort McPherson, Aklavik, and uh, old Crow people used to make uh, special trips down um, down the Firther, down the uh, Babbage River, um, just to trade with um, with, uh, with Patterson. I imagine the trip was worth the expense of oh, getting it, more provisions than paying. Oh, it sure was, mountain. yeah, yeah, because. Um, for um, like for for the basic foods like that they were getting for the staple grubs that they were getting in those days, then you paid um, a lot less. Like you know for your sugars, uh, flour, tea, sugar, that sort of thing. Okay, presently they're using this this house as a um, we call it the trapper's cabin, and they use it year round, like for travelers that are. Uh, traversing from from Alaska to to uh, to the Delta, or or people from the Delta traversing back to back to Alaska, and um, that it's presently in the spot where the Newport House was, and the Newport House was one of the oldest buildings that was standing on on Herschel, and so um, after it burnt down in 1973, then as they established the park, then they wanted. A place where trappers could go, and they decided, well, you might as well uh, build a replica of the house that was standing there. And so now, what stands there is is a replica of um, of the Newport house that was there before. Um, this jail um, uh, in, back in 1923 kept the two um, two Inuit that were hung in 1924, Alikamiak and Tatamigana. And uh, they were actually hung in that building there. This place was all open here, and uh, it was used as a community building. And for the people, had uh, had billiard tables in here for recreational purposes, and then they had um, uh, maybe um, some plays were were uh, were done in here, like maybe Christmas plays or something like that during the winter months. And that portion of the building over on that side was used for um, for storage and uh, living quarters. What's its purpose now? Is this artifact? Um, right now, right now we're using the community building for um, for interpretive purposes. Like uh, once we get um, replicas made of the artifacts or or the artifacts themselves, then we store them in cases such as these. Um, that's one of the whalers' uh, harpoon heads. And this one here is a, an end blade. And, um, and replicas are made down in, uh, down in Whitehorse, yeah, right up here. But maybe even as much as half of these are, are replicas. <laughs>